that Japanese bank pay on a five-year fixed deposit? Can anyone in this audience say? 0.8%. Still, 56% of the Japanese savings is in stock market, for which Japan is called as a country with inefficient financial model. Because a savings-based society seeks safe savings model. I can relate this to you by hundreds of studies which have been done. Why I am saying all this is, you have to paradigm shift your thinking to understand what is our economic thinking before questioning the government, question the economists, question the universities, question the media, question the intellectuals. Because it is these people who make opinion in this country. We have a totally society-dominated economics. It is not government-run economics. So yesterday I was addressing the South Indian Chamber of Commerce. I told them wherever I address these businessmen, I only tell them. They were all shocked. We never knew all this. I said, please constitute a research group. My request is let this university, let all these, these, these are supposed to be an area of learning, constitute a business, the, a study group to study the differentials of the Indian society from the Western society, which has become the model for India. India will grow, not because of your GDP, it is growing because of inherent entrepreneurship in India, which I told the Prime Minister that if the entire corporate sector has added only 1.2 million employment, he asked, how did we survive? I said, we survived because of 58 million micro business units, which employ 128 million people. 10 times the amount of employment provided by the entire corporate sector. And you know what is the amount of money they are getting for their business? 5% of the capital employed is what they are getting from banks. That is why the Prime Minister constituted the Mudra Finance Scheme. This is one of the greatest reforms. No, GST is the greatest reform because West wants GST. That we want mudra. This is the biggest reform. You know who wrote this? It is an economist from New York who wrote in the Industrial Economist a couple of weeks back. There are two great reforms which have been undertaken by the Modi government. One is gold monetization, which is a slow yielding process. And the next is mudra. But our people do not see it as reform. In fact, Raghuram Rajan saw that this mudra is a wrong move. He blocked the law. Financial journals criticize this. Where can you have discourse with this kind of ignorance? This ignorance is common to all the parties, whether it is ruling party or opposition party. I don't see any distinction. Because nobody has thought of studying the Indian society, its moorings, its impulses, its drift. The only way is, I began teaching in IIT, at least I have created some hundred young minds who are willing to do this. We have to create such young minds who are quote unquote have to deal with the modern world. And they must think of the difference between what is the Western modernity and our contemporaneity. This is the responsibility of all educated people, intellectuals, academic institutions, think tanks, and institutions like the one which is staging this program. And so I will be extremely happy if some such effort comes out of it. I know you wanted me to be on specifics. But I took you on a helicopter and showed you the world. Now, if you have any other question to ask, we have another 20 minutes' time. We can 
I will try and answer it to the best of my abilities. Thank you very much. No, I'll, I'll talk from here on. Okay. Thank you, sir. I know no time is enough. Uh, you said Matra Devo Bhava, Pitra Devo Bhava, Acharya Devo Bhava. We have volunteers here. We have a question and answer session. As sir said, that it just 20 minutes time that we have. Please raise your hand. Volunteers will come and the question can be raised. It is very difficult to express a view on it because I have a feeling that the Indian society cannot be transformed into a completely bank transacted society. And the Atakranti is based on banking as the model. And uh, after having a discussion with me, they have understood that it is not possible to tax everybody's money at the same rate. And that will produce huge inequality. And they have that the existing system of taxation is also to be partly preserved. And uh, a banking transaction tax is also necessary. This dialogue is going on between me and them in the last two months. But, uh, yeah, it should be 12. It should be 12. And then 1.8. No, 1.2 million is the addition between 1991 and 2030. 12 million, 12.8 million is the total employment, out of which 1.2 million is the addition between 1991 and 2013. In this period, 550 billion dollar foreign investment and 19 lakh crores bank funds have been ploughed into it. This one. Uh, you, it was very easy to say post-mortem analysis and say what was wrong and say the problems. But uh, what is the solution? What, would, what has to be done? It's always very easy to say, okay, this was wrong, this was wrong, post-mortem analysis. But what is important? What is to be done? I must that have been a very poor communicator. I said this in 1994. And I also said it will be a savings-driven economy. And it proved to be a savings-driven economy. I said what advice that was being given to the government is wrong. It proved to be wrong. The Indian people did not accept that advice. They behaved in the way they are natural to behave. This is what a person who observes the society can do. I am not in power. I am not a finance minister. I can only observe the society and say this is the direction in which the society will move irrespective of policies. Policies, that's what happened. Dr. Jagdish Bhagavati said did not happen. I am not saying what I said happened. What our team said happened. How do you say that we are saying this is wrong or that is wrong? That's not correct. I must have been a very poor communicator to have given you this idea. We improve our entrepreneurship of our societies. Any suggestions? I told the IIT, you go and study these centers where there is entrepreneurship, which is really going. I'll give you a small example. The Rotaract. Tamil Nadu had invited me for a meeting in Kodakanal. And there about 150 youths were there. And generally before I address the youths, I ask them to stand up and say what they want to do in their life. I give half an hour, 45 minutes for that. So they all stood up and said that we want to do some 50, 55 percent of, uh, 55 out of some 150 students and youths said, both boys and girls, we want to do business. I was surprised. Because in IIT, IIM, when I ask this question, out of 500, even 3, 4 will not say. So I asked these girls and boys who said they want to do business to stand up and say. They said they were coming from Karur, they were coming from Namakal, they were coming from Tirupur, they were coming from Coimbatore. These are all the places where entrepreneurship grows as part of a community movement. You can never structure entrepreneurship. It is like swimming. You can never teach it in classroom. The man has to jump into the well or water. Then he will know how to swim. Today, the educational system does not generate risk-bearing minds. If you ask, if a campus interviews and everybody is given 12 lakhs, 15 lakhs, 20 lakhs, who is going to set up business? I was in Bharati Dasan Institute of Management about which I wrote an article also in the Indian Express. They said, sir, you have come on a golden day to our college. What is the golden day? Sir, today McKinsey's are going to come and I'm going to tell them that we have no more students to place. All our students have been placed yesterday. This is a day of honor for us. 
60 students of the second year MBA had got placed yesterday. So I asked them, how many applications you receive to select the 60 people? We received 10,000 applications from which we select 60 people. I said, then you de why do you detain them for 10 years? They are the 60 best anyway, and you can offer them to corporates even at that time without two years detaining them. Who will give employment for the other 9,940 people? If the best 60 is to become employees, we have no understanding of entrepreneurship. So you must go to Ludhiana, Batala, Rajkot, Jamnagar, Morbi. You must go to Ramanagara here to find out what is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship goes in a social ecosystem. It doesn't grow in classrooms. That is what the government is now slowly realizing. Because of this industrialization, as industrialization is indispensable, if we consider the growth, whether it is a GDP or a mudra in the international arena, See, there is actually no contradiction. You are posing a contradiction between savings and industrialization, not at all. Industrialization has to do with the demand. And Indian domestic demand or domestic consumption is one of the highest in the world. China's domestic consumption is 36% of the GDP. Our domestic consumption is almost close to 60% of the GDP. The ideal domestic consumption is supposed to be 66%. America is over-consuming. It is 72%. That is why American industries have crashed. In India, our 60% domestic savings is sufficient to generate an 8 to 9% GDP without exports. Unfortunately, because of the current account deficit, you must know when you export, your GDP goes up. When you have a current account deficit, your GDP comes down. We are losing, we have been losing. Of course, now we have our current account deficit has turned into surplus. So long as we had current account deficit, that had been cutting into our GDP. So we need an external strategy in two, three fronts. One, how to tackle the energy problem in the long run. In 10 years, India, if it can tackle the energy problem, it will emerge as a major world power because it will be able to completely erase the current account deficit. And we don't need any external impetus to our growth. We don't need external market. Indian domestic market is sufficient to push growth for the next 50 to 60 years. That is what other countries are angling. So there is no contradiction between industrialization and savings. Actually, a structural shift in the economy is needed. Second thing that is needed is you have to promote large-scale, middle-level entrepreneurs. And you have to promote self-employed people in large number. 90% of India is self-employed. Only 8% of the people are employed in organized industries. You have to give opportunities for self-employed for which the financial system is not suited. It is the ordinary money lender who may charge 48% or 60% or 72%. He is only financing self-employed people. He must be integrated into the mudra scheme he must be refinanced because he is not financing himself. He is borrowing and financing. So the idea of the mudra, which the Prime Minister conceived, is that all these local financiers must be registered and brought into mudra and they should be refinanced so that their interest rate goes down. Why the local financiers are needed? They only know whom to finance and whom not to finance. Not somebody from Patna sitting in Coimbatore as a manager and he wants to only go back to Patna. He doesn't develop any local relationship. You can never make assessments and lend money to people. You must know the local milieu, local people, local situation. That only the local money lender knows. But he doesn't have the money. He borrows from corrupt politician and business people at 60% and lends at 72%. This has to be transformed. If in India, finance is made to fertilize the seed of entrepreneurship, in 10 years, this country will undergo a tremendous change. That is where mudra is important. Unfortunately, the hands of the government has been tied by the Reserve Bank. I think it will move now. 
I just want to know why most of the family businesses fail in the second or third generation. Like to name a few, even uh, Mukesh Ambani is uh, two kids who got divided over a period of time. And then uh, you see a few of the industries in Koyimattur, which don't have the second or the third generation to run the business. So uh, how do you relate this with the economics? The business will be run. The family will not run it. That's the only thing. <laughs> Sir, there are so many obstacles for uh, small-scale industries, ancillary units and tiny industries. And uh, there are so many uh, state-level organizations like uh, KSFC and uh, uh, central-level organizations, CEDO, SSIDC, which support small-scale industry. But still, small-scale industries are suffering and these organizations are not supporting so effectively, not working so effectively and uh, small-scale industries are not growing and though we know that these are the backbone of our country and most of the GDP is dependent on these small-scale industries. Sir, Unfortunately, I want what you are, the, all the, this question relates to 1990, not now, because all the financial institutions you mentioned have no money to give. Sir, but still in some No, of they the, have no money to give. Sir, I want your opinion regarding That's why I'm saying the entire concept of development finance changed in 1990s under the impact of liberalization and globalization, where they said development function, finance will be the function of the stock market. Capital will be provided by stock market. The banks only supplement by giving working capital and short-term capital. This has failed. We lost IDBI, we lost IFCI, we lost state financial institutions. Because the Western model is there is no development finance needed to be provided. If you liberalize the finance sector, because the market knows how to distribute money better than a bank manager. This is the idea. But we are a bank-driven economy. 80% of the national savings gets into the banking system. India, Germany, Japan are bank-driven economies. Only 7% of the Germans have stocks. 55% of the American families have stocks. Only 1.5% to 2% of Indian savings gets into stocks. In Japan, stocks are not trusted. In these countries, banks themselves act as the development finance institutions. Unfortunately, in India, banks are not allowed to act as development finance institutions because of the Reserve Bank, which is neither here nor there. And the state governments have virtually given up the task of providing the, uh, development finance for small-scale industries because the whole economic paradigm has changed. Without any nexus with the ground level realities. We have become theoreticians without understanding that this 128 million jobs is provided by 58 million micro units and the equivalent of which was in China. I want you to read a book, Deng Xiaoping and the uh, development of China. It is a research done by two Harvard University professors. This book came in the year 2013, where they proved that Chinese development occurred because of what is known as the town and village enterprises equivalent to our 58 million units. The only thing is their units were bigger than our units. Here, 58 million units employ 128 million people. There, 28 million units employ 125 million people. And first, Deng ensured they got the money. And it is proved by two Harvard, uh, two Nobel laureates who came out with their paper in the year 2015, that China lifted 150 million people out of poverty line only through town and village enterprises and not because of foreign investment. That is why the Niti Ayo this time, followed almost what happened in China. I'll just read out two sentences from that. And then we will know that the direction that is set is clear. But I don't know whether the experts and economists will follow this. Most importantly, the Niti Aayog must adhere to the tenet. While incorporating positive influences from the world, 
No single model can be transplanted from outside into the Indian scenario. After 60 years, some sensible thought has come to the system to say, you cannot transplant the ideas from outside into India. We need to find our own strategy for growth. The new institution has to zero in on what will work in and for India. It will be a Bharati approach to development. I'll conclude my speech. I don't want to take further questions because... Sir, just one question. One last question I think we can take with a request to you. Sir, I am asking regarding the current uh, situation in the country. Ours is an agriculture-based country. 70% of the people till today adhere to the agriculture. But today, the biggest question before the agriculture is the farmer suicide. Any solution to improve the confidence of the farmers and to stop it? You see, unfortunately, the economic model works on the basis that urban means development, rural area means underdevelopment. They compare Andhra and Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is 56% urban, so it is more developed than Andhra, which is 32% urbanized. This is the, the idea that urban means development is what is causing erosion in rural areas. Don't think agriculture is separate from allied obligations. I am from a village. I am from a farming family. You know, no farmer has more than two to three months work in a year. He has to be a carpenter, he has to be a mason, he has to be many other things. So these jobs have shifted out of villages. So the carpenter who had one acre of land, he has come to the city. And the farmer who had half a, one and a half acres of land, his son has become, instead of working with him, he has become a peon. You know, in most of the western Tamil Nadu, I find people less than 40 are not in villages. There is a huge rural exodus which is taking place, which means death of the villages. 